Colleen here with Kevin Nelson um, down in Garden Grove at his home. And we are going to talk a little bit about his career and how he got into what he does. Um, he's an amp tech. He's designed amps. He's worked with a lot of great musicians. So Kevin, tell us a little bit about how you got into this work. My mom was a singer. She's from Tennessee. And she um, was going to record with Chet Atkins. And uh, so, but she ended up meeting my dad. And <laughs> that was kind of the end of that. But she sang on the radio with a lot of famous people. And wow. Yeah. So she was, you know, into music. And um, what we, was her name? Uh, her name was Doris Nelson. We ended up moving out to California because my dad was in the Navy. He got stationed in Long Beach. And um, we ended up, you know, ended up out here in California. And um, when he got out of the Navy, uh, he went to work at Kaiser Steel in Fontana. Mm. And so he was a crane operator at Kaiser for 45 years or something. I was a drummer. I started out in third grade playing drums. And then when I was, um, I was, think I was 14, I asked my mom for a set of drums for my birthday. <laughs> and she says, well, you know, Drums are kind of loud and they're kind of expensive. <laughs> Her and my dad went out to the swap meet and bought me this guitar for fifteen dollars. Wow. <laughs> my brother-in-law, uh, his name is Gene Smart. He was a uh, also an engineer, and when he was going to college, him and his brother had made themselves a twin reverb oh, from scratch. They built one. Yeah, and because uh, they wanted to have stuff to play, you know. He built me this amp here. He took a 30 watt hi-fi amp, drove holes in it, put fender tone controls. <laughs> so, nice. <laughs> yeah. So basically I had a 30 watt fender, you know. My dad and I built these two 212 cabinets. There was this guy in Riverside, his name was Don Underwood. He was a guitar luthier. He had this Epiphone, I think it's called a Crestwood or Wilshire. And um, I saved up enough to buy that. I paid $125. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, I started playing in bands at that time. I met a guy in Fontana. His name was Fred Adams. And he, well, a friend of mine and I played guitars. He had a broadcaster and I had my cheapy guitar. <laughs> and so we'd go to his house and play out of this little silver tone about this big, you know. And so we started going around and listening to different bands play live, um, local bands, mm. you know. And so we went to this uh, dance at a Catholic school or something. And there, there was this band, this guy was playing a red SG and he sounded like Clapton. And he was so good and they're playing cream stuff, you know. Nice. I was like, I wanna sound like that. <laughs> I figured out that I might be able to get that sound if I got the LPB one. So I went around to this music store, so I found one for $5. And I was already dabbling in electronics at that time, you know, because of my homemade tube amp, I was searching out tube chassis that I could sort of mimic this. Yeah. You know, and learn about fenders and, you know, that kind of thing. I built a few of them and it really helped. Wow. Yeah. And so with that amp, I played, we started a band and I played in a band, you know, and, and we weren't very good, but we we're, you know. You had some fun. We were barely in high school, yeah. So you so. literally just, you heard this sound that you really liked, and then you just built an amp to in order to achieve that sound. Yeah, well, mostly I built the LTV one to help achieve the oh, sound. okay, okay, okay. But the amp thing comes later. You know, I'm still building amps, but some of those amps, I would build the LPB one into it. I see. Okay. Yeah, That's so, cool. Yeah. And there was a guy named Fred Adams and he had this big 215 cabinet with a horn and the amp on top. And it was all covered in psychedelic material. Yeah. You know, <laughs> They're playing like Iron Butterfly and all this kind of stuff, you know, of the era. And Fred was taking electronics at uh, Chafee College. And so him and I became friends. And so I used to ask him all kinds of questions because he's pretty knowledgeable, you know. And so I started building more and building more and building more tube amps. And Fred had a friend called Jack Dabisca, who was a keyboard player, and he had Hammonds. Mm. So we would, you know, work on his Leslie's and work on his Hammond. And we decided that we wanted to build these large cabinets to accommodate Jack's keyboard. I got into building these 
Altec style cabinets. Oh, wow. That's you built these? theater, but scaled down for a 12. And then a, a friend asked me, says, could you build me a tube PA? I was probably 16 at the time, maybe That's 17. That's really impressive. So Fred and I progressed and I progressed and I built these 412s. By the time I was in high school, those are kind of in process. And here's a picture of them, of me playing them. And those are the two stacks I made. And basically, they were basement amps with an extra gain mm -hmm. stage in them. So cool. they get overdrive and master volumes. Wow, you know? cool. I like the Altec designs and I liked Altec speakers. And so I built this rig here. It's a, it's a beefed up concert amp. Yeah, that cool. we turned into a head, and it's 120 watts. And then, of course, my Les Paul. And I was probably about 17 or 18. I liked the Altec product so much, I called and asked them if I could get a job down there. And they said, why do you want to work here? I said, because I like your products, you know, but especially the guitar speakers. And um, the guy would not hire me. Why? And, well, he just said, you're too young, you know. And he goes, and you got to drive so far. I just don't trust that you'll be making it to work on time. And I said, yeah, I will. I will. I promise. You know, so after five times of applying, you oh, finally wow. hired me. Wow. Determination and persistence. Yeah. So I worked in the back, you know, in the factory. And, you know, I did electronics work. I'd solder crossovers or mount speakers and cabinets or, you know, yeah. just the mundane kind of things, you know. But um, I asked him, I go, I've been working on a lot of Altec amps for years, you know, the old green tube amps, mm -hmm. you know, and I want a job in the lab. And he says, no, you, nobody gets a job in the lab without a degree. You got to have a degree, and, which at the time I was just out of high school, so I didn't have a degree. <laughs> and, right. Uh, they wouldn't even let you be a, a tester on the end of the line really? unless you had a degree. So I worked there for like a year and I said, you know, this isn't exactly what I wanted to be, you right. know. And so I quit Altec and uh, my mom had suggested, why don't you, you know, uh, move back to Fontana and you could stay with us temporarily and go to college. And I said, well, okay. And just out of high school, I'd been a cabinet maker. I made mm -hmm. kitchen cabinets for trailers and stuff. So I've always built cabinets sure. like that. And, but I finally uh, took her advice <laughs> and I went to college and there was a music store right up the street from the college. And John Jorgensen knew the owner of the store. And his name was Roy Parker. And Roy had been a service manager at Fender. Okay. And so he was in the Navy. And uh, he was a single man and a single man on a carrier. His ears got damaged. Mm. And so they retrained him as a tech. Okay. Yeah. So he was a tech. And uh, when got out... Um, he got a job at Fender as a service manager because he was musical sure. and a tech, you know, at the same time. And so uh, he ended up meeting all these guys at Fender, you know, Steve Sost, mm -hmm. uh, Wayne Charvel, all mm -hmm. these people would, and he would uh, hire them as warranty repair centers. Okay. Things yeah, like that, yeah. you know. But uh, the whole service center was full of rare objects because they needed them for warranty replacements, mm -hmm. you know. So he decided that he was going to take his settlement money and start his own music store and buy up all this stuff in the service. John Jorgensen calls me on the phone and he says, Hey, Kev, I want you to, um, I want you to build me this Princeton 100 watts. And I go, John, he goes, no, we're going to take it and take the grill cloth off and cut it out for an Altec 12. They hold 100 watts. Okay, now you're talking. And so the Princeton has the two Breck fire and two 66s. Mm -hmm. So I punched an extra hole in the chassis and I put four 6L6s. Okay. Solid state rectifier. And I put the power transformer, which is about that big, yeah. in the bottom. And I oh, ran okay. wires up in yep. the chassis. <laughs> and so I got my 100 watts and I took the volume, tone, speed, and intensity. I turned it into volume, treble, middle, bass. Wow, okay. So he had no a, more tremolo. Yeah. So he had a Fender, basically. It was 100 watts. He says, I, I got this job at Disneyland. I want to play a twin. But they won't let me. They said it's too heavy and too loud. And so that's why he asked me to do the 100-watt princess so he could disguise it. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so uh, 
he takes it into this music store that Roy owned. And he says, check this out, Roy. This is my 100-watt Princeton. And Roy looks at it. He goes, who did this? <laughs> and he says, my friend Kevin from Fontana made this. And, and Roy gave him his card. He goes, have him call me. So he hired me to manage his music store. Oh, cool. And do all the repairs. And we had so much product, we could build a lot of things. You know, you know he claimed that he was the first to suggest the master volume to Fender. Oh, interesting. Yeah, back way back when. You yeah. know, so the twins had it. He said, but they didn't really carry it out the way I wanted them to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Back to my friend Fred. He got a job at this place in San Bernardino called Wild West Music Services. And they had some real hip techs there. And so Fred started working there. And the owner, his name was Mark Johnson, he was a Hammond organ specialist. And so he would go out and service all these Hammonds at churches and mm -hmm. people's homes, you know, that kind of thing. A lot of bands were using Hammonds and Leslie's and they'd haul them around to gig. Roy and I would cut them in half. <laughs> And Chop them. Make them, yeah, make them half the weight, you know, <laughs> so people could put them in the back of their station wagons and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Back to Wild West, they decided that they wanted to make Leslie's more powerful. Mm. So back then, we didn't call them mods, we called them beef ups. Okay, I like that. <laughs> yeah, because at the time, like I said, it was all about power. Yeah. You know, you got to have the watts, you know. So we would basically take the 30 watt Leslie amp. And turn it into a hundred watts with twin wow. transformers. Wow. Okay. And then the we changed the fifteen to a JVL mm -hmm. or an Altec fifteen, mm -hmm. so to hold the power. And then um, up at the top, they had uh, manufactured. Uh, Mark Johnson had manufactured a double driver adapter, and we would put these two really high powered university drivers on the top of the spinning horn you know yeah so they were loud you know? and uh, we got to go see a lot of bands using them you know which is that's pretty awesome. great yeah back to roy parker i worked for roy for about four years roy decided that he wanted to sell his store so he sold the store to mark johnson in san Bernardino at wild west wow yeah. so he went to work for roland and I went to work for Wild West. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we did speaker reconing. Okay. You know, we'd fix everything, turntables, you name it. You know, Anything they, audio. Yeah, they'd take them in. And, you know, and, and so I kind of got a little bit more versed in solid state. I worked there for about a year. And Roy calls me on the phone and he says, Hey, Kev, you and Deb want to move to the beach? <laughs> I go, let me think. Yeah. Yeah, twist my arm. <laughs> so, We're there. <laughs> yeah. So he goes, well, I got this job at this company called Barkus Ferry. He goes, they make amps and they make string instruments and they make guitar pickups for acoustic guitars, you know, crystal pickups. Mm -hmm. He says they need a international service manager to look at their amps, cover any warranty work, do, you know, take care of the paperwork, whatever needs to be done. My wife and I packed up and we moved out here wow. and we got us a, a little house and um, I went to work at Barkus. You know, Hank, I've got all these demos that I recorded years ago that I would love to upload, to share and stream. So I decided why not try out DistroKid? As we know, DistroKid is a service that helps musicians upload their music to all major streaming platforms. Use so my channel get 30% off at the link I will post below, whatever it may be, get it uploaded. So Bob Bob Crooks was designing these amps and I handled all the service duties. About a, a year in after I was there, they decided that they didn't want to make guitar amps anymore. Ooh. Yeah, just pickups. We're making more money on pickups. Sure. And, you know, so they laid me off. Aww. And, um, so, you know, they gave me this nice flowery letter. Oh, like, Kevin did a great job. Uh, you know. You're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how it is in the industry. You yep. Know? So I, you know, I was out of work. And one of the secretaries that worked with me at Barkas had gotten a job at Altec. Okay. Yeah. I feel a full circle moment about to happen. It is. <laughs> and so she calls me on the phone and goes, hey, Kev, I heard they laid you off. And I go, yeah. She goes, well, these guys at Altec are looking for a lab guy. I dropped your name. Is that okay? <laughs> I said, yeah. So they called me on the phone at lunch and I said, okay, I'll you know, come out and interview. So I went at lunch and I interviewed with them and they hired me. 
So I wasn't out of work one single day. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> and it was like kind of your dream at the beginning to work for Altec in the lab. Right. Uh, one of my projects was uh, the Voice of the Highway, powered speakers that they would put in high-end cars. And so, um, you know, you have your subwoofer in the rear window, and, uh, and they were kind of the first to be doing that, you mm -hmm. know. And uh, so that was one of my projects, but also we're working on high-powered solid-state power amps. Mm. And I would build all the prototypes and lay out the boards. They had an anechoic chamber, and they would put speakers in the ground for days and run them like high power for days on the little little can, you know. Wow. <laughs> they come back and go, yep, still working. And so I did that for maybe a year. And then um, one of the speaker engineers brought me this article from uh, the LA Times. And he goes, you're a guitar amp guy, right? And I go, yeah. And he goes, you might be interested in this. And I read, it's just Leo Fender's company, Music Man, looking for a guitar amp engineer. Oh, man. And I was like, dream job. <laughs> Leo Fender, okay. Two vamps, yeah, okay. So I went out there again at lunch, and I interviewed with who had become their chief engineer. His name was Mark Wentling. Mm. And so Mark Wentling, they hired him from MXR. And so he moved out from New York to be their engineer, but he was a chip guy. Yeah. You know, and the music bands, as you know, are hybrid. Yep. So they had all... Op all amps in the front end, yep. and then they had the tube power amp in the back end. So he needed a tube guy to help him out. Yeah. You know? So real quick, there, what year was this about? Oh gosh, eighty something. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I went in for the interview, and and, and so we started talking. I'm, and I told Mark, I go, yeah, you guys are using these kind of transformers and. This kind of pots and these kind of knobs and yeah i'm, I'm just was super familiar with the design mm. you know and he looks at me he goes how do you know so much about these <laughs> and i said well i'm friends with bob lulai and he goes don't ever say that name <laughs> i go why and he goes because this is all about leo he's the music man <laughs> bob lulai was um electronics professor at cal state san bernardino oh, wow. And so him and I were friends way early. And, you know, uh, that's when I met Steve Sost was way early in Roy store because we oh, would trade cool. guitars. That's and, cool. Yeah. And become friends. And then Wayne Charvel, too. So Bob Lulai had this company called Lulai Solid Sound. And he was making high-powered salt state power amps for PA and a lot of PA gear. And so Leo hired him to design the Music Man amps. Wow. So Bob would come into the store and he also would come into Wild West, you know, cause we're all sort of tied together. Right. And um, he would show us the Music Man prototypes. And yeah, you know, these are the latest things. These are op amps, you know, nobody's really using them. And so we want this to be the latest technical thing, you know. Lulai, you know, showed, like I said, he showed us all these Music Man amps and I knew a lot about them. And, uh, Mark was into chips, so he helped me get more familiar with mm -hmm. op amps and how they work and, and that sort of thing. And so we kind of did mutual design work on the amps. And the 130-watt power amp had a tube driver, mm -hmm. a 12X7, so that when you dialed up the gain in the solid-state part, it would overdrive the tube. Mm -hmm. So you get tube overdrive, yeah. you know, and that drove the power amp. And so the power amp could break up as well. So it was mostly tube sounds. Yep. But the 130 watt thing, it became a little bit unreliable. Mm -hmm. They, uh, you know, they would have red plating yep. and things like that, you know. So they had to come up with something else. Mm -hmm. So we came up with this circuit that's um, class B. And what it is, is a lot of people, when they look at music and schematics, they don't know how to work on it mm. because it's so unusual. Yeah. <laughs> and what they do is they put a transistor in the cathode and then the grid, which would normally be your negative bias, mm -hmm. is positive. And so we'd use an op amp to drive the transistors and they would modulate the cathodes on and off. Mm -hmm. And we're, we were able to get 100 watts of two 6L6s yeah. because wow. they were only on in the duty cycle and they'd shut off right. for the next wave, half wave for them, you know? Wow. So, they would run really cool. You could almost touch them with your hands. 
and they would last a long, long mm-hmm. time, you know. And then, uh, you know, we because of Mark's background, we designed a lot of cool things into them. It was kind of a cool thing, you know, be there. So you were there when they started putting the phasers in, in the Music Man amps. Yeah. Cool. So I was there at Music Man for like, you know, uh, about four years, something like wow. that. Wow. And um, I have all the schematics for Music Man. I saw that binder. I was like, ooh, yeah, that looks cool. Yeah, from day one. Yeah. You know, part of my responsibilities was to uh, supply, you know, service stuff for dealers. Right. You know? And they sold, like, worldwide, you know. So these were the later music mm-hmm. bands. You, could, you, know, you, see it? you can see my name. Oh, Kevin. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And it worked pretty good. I'm so, like I said, I'm so lucky. And I had a lot to do with the design of the RD50, mm-hmm. which is 2606 is 50 watts. Yep. And that's a kind of a, a cult following amp because yes. we didn't make that many. It was right at the end of Music Man. Mm-hmm. The uh, solo on Don't Fear the Reaper, that it's smooth. Yeah. The sound I love. That, that was that amp that wow. we used. So. so Music Man ended in a very bad way. Oh. One day we got this shipment back from Holland, I believe it was, and they told us, you know, the necks aren't adjusting properly. And Leo had his own factory up in up in Fullerton, mm. and that was called CLF Research. And then Music Man had the amp factory. And Music Man was originally started by three stockholders. There was mm. Forrest White, who built mm-hmm. amps, and... Uh, lap steels. Yep. He was buddies with Leo. Mm-hmm. So Leo was the other stockholder. And then the California sales rep um, for Fender um, was the third partner. Tom Walker was his name. And he designed the Fender Blender and, you know, the Fuzzwa mm-hmm. and some things like that, you know, for Fender. So he was an electronics guy also. And so they all went together and formed this corporation, Music Man. And um, so one day, we get these necks back, and so we decided to saw them in half <laughs> and see what was going on because they weren't adjusted yeah, probably right. backwards. And sure enough, the truss rods were in backwards, upside down. Oh, yeah. and, and the whole batch? Yeah, the whole batch. And Ooh, so, that's an oversight. Yeah, so Tom Walker he gets really mad, <laughs> and, and he says, uh, Leo, you got to remake these guitars. You know, you got to replace them because they're all bad. and the necks are upside down, the truss rods. And Leo goes, oh, my guys would never do that. And so they got a big fight. Oh, no. Yeah, I mean, a fist fight in the office. <laughs> These two old guys are going at it in the office. Oh, my God. Yeah. So Leo Ooh. gets Leo gets pissed off. <laughs> says, all right, you're not getting any more guitars at all. So Tom Walker's like left. <laughs> holding the bag you know nothing to... oh man so now so now he's on the line for all those bad guitars and sales you know those guitars and most amp companies you find well not most but some like fender there's amps and there's the guitars and guitars have much fewer parts in right. them than an amp and right. so they're kind of a loss leader they want the amps to go with the guitars but they cost a lot more to make mm-hmm. so the guitar kind of offsets the the amp right. price you know and so we were only making amps and super high quality mm-hmm. ones at that. And um, so Tom Walker was like struggling to keep things afloat. And so he hired guys from the outside like Grover Jackson mm-hmm. and Wayne Charvel and these people to make the Music Man guitars for him. Okay. Uh, because he sued Leo and he won the name Music Man. Oh, wow. Yeah, because Leo didn't want anything to do with it. So then that was the end of Leo being affiliated with Music Man. Yeah. Forrest White got so mad that he came in with one of the necks that was upside (laughs) down, and he started smacking Tom Walker with it. Oh, (laughs) shit. (laughs) Oh, my God. True story. I swear it. Holy cow. And I was in the the room next door. You know, we'd hear the ruckus, you know, and that. There's a magazine now called the History of Music Man by a guy named Frank Green. If you ever read that, it tells the whole story. Oh, wow. About I'll, get, yeah. I'll have to get my hands on that. Yeah. And so, luckily, Tom Walker was able to block it. And uh, <laughs> it was it was a very sad ending. That is really a sad and violent ending. Yeah. They, end, they ended it right there. And, 
And Tom Walker just eventually gave up. He said, that's it. I can't afford to keep this company afloat. Tom ended up um, selling Music Man to Ernie Ball. They basically bought all the inventory that was left. They called me into the office. Hey, Kev, you know, we're closing down the amp thing, so we don't really need an amp guy anymore. They had all these amps left in their inventory, which wasn't too many, but a few. And so I made this agreement with them to service all the amps because they had one-year warranty. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I'll leave the company, but we'll make this agreement that if I'll do all the warranty service work for your amps that you have in stock for one year if you trade me all the leftovers in the warehouse, mm -hmm. which were parts. And so I hauled it all home and I put it all in my den. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> the storage room. Yeah, exactly. And so I still have all the Music Man PC boards that went, wow. went into the amps that yeah. they made. They never put them in the amps. They were all pre-made and ready to build amps, but they didn't build the product. Wow. So I yeah. have boxes and boxes of those. And they have all these half-watt Allen Bradley resistors in them. Wow. And, you know, Switchcraft phone jacks. And, you know, they're full of really high-quality yeah. stuff. You, you know? still have those boards? I do. Yeah. It's good I, to know. I have some of them here where I can rob mm -hmm. from them. And others in storage. You know, in wow. Storage. All right. Cool. And I have all the handmade prototype PC boards that Mark and I designed. And even some that were designed before Mark and I. So I have the whole history. I have this. I have all the protos. I have all the manufacturing boards. and You have a, a museum of, of Music Man. Yeah. I'm the Music Man guy, I guess. That's <laughs> great. You're the Music Man now. And I was out of work for a while. I didn't know what to do, you know, and, and so I started this company called Mods by Mail. I would have people ship me in their fenders or marshals, mm -hmm. and I put extra gain stages and master volumes. Mark Wentling calls me on the phone, and he says, hey, Kev, you want to work at Fender? <laughs> I go, yeah, <laughs> that's the king of the hill. Yeah, yeah I want to work at Fender. So they had just sold Fender. TBS mm -hmm. to all the employees and they were the stockholders. Oh, wow. But I worked in the lab and, you know, it was kind of high pressure. They had a lot of artists, of course. Mm -hmm. I would do service work on all the artist stuff. All know. the amps. Yeah. I mean, they started working on, have you seen the red knob twin? Yeah. They call it the evil twin. Yep. Yeah, Mark and I worked on that. I, I did the layout. Cool. Mark did the engineering. I decided that I didn't like the way Fender was building the stuff. And when you're an engineer, you don't want to be associated yeah. with that, yeah. you know. And so I left. I resigned. The Red Knob Twin did a lot. Mm -hmm. But the parts weren't your standard right. Fender quality, right. you know. That was probably around the time that they started using, like, plastic jacks. and Yeah, not exactly. The, right. If you were to work for Fender, you wanted it to be, like, Back when it, they were using high quality, just yeah. more aligned with your values as an engineer. So I quit and I went back to work for Gary Sunday at Randall. And him and I worked on lots of different guitar amps. And, and they did have a lot of endorsies mm -hmm. um, that we worked for. There's Sammy Hagar, which I went to high school with. No way. <laughs> yeah. He was using them. The Blasters and Jethro Tull and you know Ronnie Dio and all these, all these bands were kind of getting hip to the Randall sound yeah you know? even this guy oh Alan man. Holdsworth I worked there at Randall for a while with Gary and Don decided to retire so he put the company up for sale and there was a uh, guy in Wisconsin his name was Chuck Foss and he had owned a Casio distribution he purchased Randall I would do all the PC board layout and um, Gary was also very good at it you know I did learn a lot about manufacturing techniques, you know, because mm -hmm. I was working in industry, Fender and uh, Randall. And, and so finally, Chuck Foss, because he didn't know what he was doing, he ran the company into the ground. He made, oh, man, you, you were there for like the ending of a lot of companies. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Ray of Hope at the end of the rainbow or whatever, um, he needed rescuing financially. So he goes to this bank in Chicago, which is very near Wisconsin, you yep. know, <laughs> and they were investors. And so they said, okay, Chuck, we'll give you another chance. We'll put our money into the corporation, but not going to call it just Randall anymore, but it's going to be called U.S. Music. 
and we're going to buy all these successful companies to go with it. Oh. So we're guaranteed not to lose our money, you know. Okay. And so they bought Guild, mm -hmm. and they had bought Randall, and they bought um, Matchless. Oh, no way. Okay. Yeah. So Gary left, and Gary was the nicest guy. He's the best guy I ever worked with. No politics, no yeah, no egos, problems. Just talent. He was so nice. And his family, they owned a company called Orange County Speaker Recording. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that, his wife ran that, you know. So he was a very knowledgeable guy. And, of course, I needed the money to yeah. support my family. And um, so I became chief engineer when he left. For U.S. music. U.S. music, yeah. And that's how you got in with Guild. Yeah. And I was really thrilled that they bought Guild. Yeah. Because I'd always been a Guild acoustic player mm -hmm. since I was young. At Randall, I kept on with the kind of Gary's le legacy, mm -hmm. so to speak, you know. And I, I did amps for Dimebag Daryl, the Pantera guy, yeah. Poison, Tesla. You know, we just kept the artist thing going. And um, I did a lot of work for Jethro Tull. Nice. Yeah, and we got involved with them. And I cool. did I did a bunch of... Uh, work for them when especially when they came to california mm -hmm. this is ian and my wife her birthday and ian's birthday were on the same day okay. she loves jethro tull the very first concert i took her to she'd been to others but as a couple i went to the forum and uh we saw jethro tull it was nice. called bursting out was a tour and so jethro tull was a big part of your guys's relationship yeah this is david Pegg. he was a founding member of the folk rock group called Fairport Convention. And this is Martin Barr. And of course, my wife. <laughs> your lovely wife. Yeah. I like your guild shirt. Yeah. There's Marshall Tucker oh. Band. I did work for them, so they autographed that. <gasps> my daughter is a flute player, and they oh, had a cool. flute player in yeah. the band, you know. And now my daughter has her degree in music from Cal State Fullerton, and uh, she's a music teacher. That's amazing. Yeah, so music stayed in the family. I love that. And is last, she your only child? No, we have two daughters. Oh, okay. And they're both amazing vocalists. Wow. So. You've had your hand in the history of two amps, that's for sure. You deserve to be in that book. So I'm doing repairs out of the house. And I get a call from this guy named Joe Branstetter. And he was a partner with Harold Rhodes in Harold's music business. Harold made his piano learning method. Okay. And yeah. he had made the first Rhodes out of aircraft parts during World War II. For recovering servicemen who were in the hospital, they could lay this free piano, it was called, on their lap and learn how to play piano wow. with his method, you know, wow. a simplified method. Yeah. You know? And so Joe owned a chain of piano stores, like real pianos. Mm -hmm. And so he was selling Harold's piano method to his customers. And so he became friends with Harold. And then Harold passed away. And so he decided that he was going to try and buy the name from Harold's wife. Mm. And so he made an offer and she sold it to him. Okay. And so he owned the name and he, he one day he calls me on the phone and he says, uh, you're Kevin Nelson, right? I said, yeah. He goes, everybody I call is dropping your name. They all say, you're the guy. <laughs> I was like, for what? <laughs> he goes, oh, well, I own roads and, you know, we're looking for an engineer to, you know, kind of oversee the project. And we're remaking this piano called the Mark V. I helped design a preamp for the roads that has all the tone controls and the stereo tremolo like they used to have. Yeah. A powered speaker bottom, you know, which we used digital amps, mm -hmm. you know, to do. And uh, so we released the uh, Mark V roads. You've had quite the career and doing a bunch of different things that all kind of tie together well i do want to tell you the eric clapton preamp story yeah when i worked at fender like i told you that dan says you're the clapton guy i want you to make this preamp do what eric wants mm -hmm. so i did my thing to it and a guy named don lace he had been a military magnetics engineer so he designed these lace pickups to go in it because the preamp had quite a boost mm -hmm. and so the strat pickups are noisy because they're single Mm -hmm. So he invented these anti-hum lace pickups mm -hmm. for it. I got to at least do the electronics. Yeah. <laughs> so we built the Clapton prototype. We took his blackie neck and we laser scanned it so we could make 
exact copies right. of Blackie, you know. Cool. And so we did the Blackie neck and painted him the colors of his Ferraris. Nice. <laughs> you know, we thought that'd have a feel, you know. So we, he was making the August album and uh, down in Ocean Studios. And so we went down there to present him with the guitar and Phil Collins was back there doing the mixing and all this stuff. Wow. A lot of famous people, yeah. Greg Fillingaines and, you know, Tina Turner and all these people, you know? And so Eric had all his guitars lined up, his SG, his psychedelic, you know, SG with the 335 and Blackie and, you know, we presented him with the guitar and then we drove back to Fender and he called back later on that day. And he says, uh, you know, this is really cool, but, you know, I need a little more gain. I'm looking for some dirt, you mm -hmm. know, when I need it. And so we went back the next day, and I go, I could do that, and you know, change a part, you know, change a resistor. Right. So I brought my soldering iron. We pulled it apart. It took about 15 minutes. <laughs> I changed the part. And we put it back together. And before we even driven back to Fender, he had called and said, okay, I'll sign on. It's wow. Wow. So to this day, he still is a Fender endorsing. Because of your resistor swap. <laughs> uh, you know, like I said, I'm a humble guy. <laughs> it's, it was a team effort. Of but, course, of yeah. course. And that preamp is still available. And the way it works is in the there's a knob called TBX. And when it's in the middle, it's half and half. When mm -hmm. you turn one way, it's all strat. Mm -hmm. When you turn it the other way, it starts adding this mid-boost, which we designed to imitate the Gibson curve. Kevin, thank you so much for chatting with me today. I loved hearing about your career. Well, You've had you. you have some great stories and some awesome experience. Well, thank some you once that. in a lifetime projects. Thanks, Kevin. Oops, thank you. <laughs> I'll catch you next time.